We're fortunate today. We have one at Dartmouth's own, and it's a real pleasure to have a faculty member that's right in our midst speak to us. We have uh, Dr. Richard Granger. Uh, Professor Granger is, a, is in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at Dartmouth. Uh, he's an expert in brain modeling. He's published more than 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, Dr. Granger runs the um, Brain Engineering Laboratory, which is a very interesting multidisciplinary um, initiative that bringing together mathematicians, engineers, and science, computer scientists to try to model the brain. Some of his recent titles are very intriguing. For example, talking about the hypergeometric connectivity hypothesis as well as models of the th thalamocortical system. So he, um, he's a real expert in this area. I was privileged to see him talk not too long ago and some of you might have been at the uh, polytrauma brain uh, symposium. Um, I don't know if it was brain, I guess it was just the polytrauma symposium that was here in August that Joe Rosen did and happened to catch uh, Dr. Granger's talk so we're in for a real treat today. Uh, to have him speak. So, Rich, if you're ready, we'll let you have it. Okay, so uh, increasingly the analytical tools that we have are uh, enabling us to drill down and uh, pull apart, analyze brain circuits in, in a way that has uh, simply not been possible until uh, very recent years. Um, this is to remind me to say that uh, pretty much all the work that I'm going to be describing today was done by someone other than me. Uh, and this is a list, partial list really, of uh, collaborators, current, current collaborators, um, including uh, a bunch of uh, graduate and undergraduate students, uh, faculty members um, here and elsewhere. Uh, most of what I'm going to be doing is describing to you uh, brain circuit computation. That is, we're going to look at brain circuits, I'm going to derive some algorithms, we're going to analyze those algorithms, and we're going to apply them and see how it is that brain circuits are doing the kinds of things that they do. Your brain circuits right now are engaged in combination of visual and auditory perception. You're looking at me, you're listening to a rapid fire stream of auditory input. Uh, you're effortlessly integrating it with a bunch of memories that you already have stored. You might be storing new, inf new information in there. Um, all of those abilities to recognize these things, to listen to this speech, to recognize uh, my face, to track it as I move back and forth, all of those abilities, which are like baby abilities that anyone can do, uh, some people's dogs can do them, uh, they're all outside the reach of engineering. You can't build engineering boxes that recognize faces with anything like the accuracy or reliability that a human can do it. We can't build boxes that recognize, say, speech. So the primary motivator is, for, the, for the talk is that brains do things that we uh, cannot build ar arbitrary engineering methods for. And it isn't for lack of smart people trying, and it isn't for lack of money. Uh, billions and billions have been spent between uh, industry and the military on tasks of this kind. Uh, an example that uh, always brings it home is that of uh, we were talking about it earlier today, that of uh, the simple phone operator. That is, you uh, call up, uh, you, you dial zero, and it says city and state. You say Hanover, New Hampshire. And then it says, what listing, please? And you say something, lose restaurant. And it pauses, and then it says, please wait for a human operator. That task that it's trying to do of simply listening to that brief speech stream, lose restaurant, uh, especially when uttered by someone like me with absolutely no discernible accent. Right? Uh, and all it has to do is match it against an existing database of the entries in the Hanover phone book. Right? The Hanover phone book. Right? Tiny little thing. 50% of the time, it'll bop over to uh, a human operator and it'll fail to do that match. Try it yourself. You can try this experiment yourself at home. Uh, it's remarkable how hard it apparently is to do that 
apparently simple task. Let alone, and that's a very constrained task, just a very brief little speech stream, let alone the, the unconstrained task of just listening to whatever it is that I'm going to say and somehow effortlessly, pretty effortlessly, understanding it. <laughs> the circuits that carry out those tasks apparently, apparently are doing some kind of something that we can think of as non-standard engineering. They're just circuits, they're not mystical, and we are going to spend the next hour demystifying them as much as possible. Uh, they do have some really, really interesting characteristics. In fact, some downright handy characteristics. One, they're intrinsically parallel. So all the algorithms that they carry out are being carried out in parallel. One of the reasons we know this is that individual brain cells are unbelievably, unimaginably, embarrassingly slow. So they operate on the millisecond time scale. And no self-respecting engineer would build a computer that operates on the millisecond time scale. And yet our brains, again, are outperforming most of those things that you can build. Uh, they scale so that the brains of mammals, for instance, which we're going to focus on, are in incredibly similar. So the brain of a rat is incredibly similar to your brain. And, and mine, not, not just your brain, sorry. <laughs> our brains. Uh, our brains are very similar to those of rat brains. And uh, in fact, trained anatomists can have enormous trouble uh, uh, being able to tell the difference if you just simply give, it, uh, give, uh, give them a slide of uh, rat brain tissue and human brain tissue. They're amazingly alike. And yet they scale from the size of a mouse to the size of a mammoth. Uh, a good five orders of magnitude, and as they're scaling, a point we're going to bring up uh, uh, in uh, detail later, uh, as they're scaling, even though they simply get bigger and they stay enormously similar to each other, clearly dogs can do things that rats can't, monkeys can do things that dogs can't, many humans can do things that most monkeys can't. Uh, you acquire you acquire new abilities as this thing scales up. That's a constraint. It's a computational constraint. How do you build something where you just make more of it and somehow you get new abilities out? Most of the abilities that it has are based on learning. So it is, uh, it, it acquires new information that comes built in with quite a bit of stuff. When you're a baby, you do indeed have species-specific behaviors, whether you think so or like the idea or not. Uh, you do, and then you acquire everything else. And somehow that learning process is something that we want to capture. Furthermore, I, I'm using a phrase here, end-to-end -end integration, by which I mean you can go all the way from seeing something to acting on something. I can see that bottle. I can reach over. I can pick it up. I can see where I just moved it to. I can put it back. And all of that seamlessly. Turns out, engineering, not so much. Uh, when you try and build things like that, they really don't do uh, what you design them to do. Anybody who's had experience building such things is cringing right now because they know it's true. Uh, so uh, the status of what I'm going to describe to you is a series of algorithms that are derived from brain circuits, um, an architecture that those individual circuits fit into, big systems, um, analyses of these um, that scale, that can be implemented in silicon, I'll show you examples, and that can be fielded in uh, sensor and robot implementations. And as we go through, I'm going to try to extract a, a set of principles that are underlying the methods that we're using, and we'll sort of build up a set of uh, what we can call take-home messages that uh, uh, that infuse the, the, the topic. The outline will be like this. Oh, I have this. Here we go. Uh, Dartmouth Green. Um, <coughs> I'm going to first talk about these brain circuits. I'm going to talk about how we derive algorithms from those, how those algorithms fit into architectures. Uh, so first the circuits, um, then algorithms, architectures, and learning, how we build circuits and then systems, and then finally how we uh, uh, implement these and apply them down to uh, applications, implementations, and in particular a bunch of uh, robot examples. So let's start with circuits. Mammals. You are a mammal and mammals were invented about 200 million years ago. They diverged from the reptiles. They kept the reptilian brain but they added this stuff, this stuff on top called neocortex which grows almost without bound so much so that uh, your brain, human brains, are it's, it's hard to see all the old reptilian stuff buried underneath the, uh, the neocortical surface.